Okay, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming. Um, so this is the latest in our Dean's Seminar Series, our kind of uh, Distinguished Speaker Series. And I'm very, uh, very happy to welcome Ellen Doe. Is it Doe? Is that correct? Doe, Doe, Ellen Doe, um, today. Um, she works at the kind of intersection of disciplines. She's got interests in design games, creativity, cognition, health and happiness, ambient intelligence, innovation, and intelligent healthcare. She's currently at the University of Colorado in Boulder, where she's Director of Partnerships and Innovation for an institute called Atlas, and also a professor in the Department of Computer Science there. But she's also worked at various uh, kind of top universities in the world, including Georgia Tech and CMU and so forth. So I think it's going to be a very entertaining and inspiring talk this morning. I hope, no pressure. Um, and so with that, I'll, I'll hand you over to Ellen, and we all look forward to hearing you speak. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, so I promise I'll be entertaining so you don't get distracted by that one. All right, so today I want to talk about design computing or computation, computational design. So what I'm talking about is actually um, all kind of keywords together. We're building system, we're talking about design, we're talking about maybe a little bit artificial intelligence and computational representation or computational support for design. So in my short talk, I will tell you what I've been doing with my researchers, students, and what we build is we build things. So the artifact is software, hardware together. We build things to help us think, to think about the questions, think about issues, and also this is a way of working. So this is a method and tool to make things so we can build computational support for making things or thinking about design. And I'm going to divide my talk into three parts, sketching, smart object, and Qt. Uh, Qt actually stands for creating unique technology for everyone. And this is also do a, like a quick overview about the things I have been doing for the past like 20 something years. All right, so I'm going to run really fast because I have a lot of things to show. Okay, first about sketching. So. I was interested in design sketches and design tool because um, the idea is that can we use computer to support design? And how do we understand um, design computing? What's needed? And so cognition is becoming important. What do people do? So in, in a way, we want to support design activity and we need to understand design activity. So we have this romantic vision, people have a coffee or thinking about things when they do designing, but what if we want to support computation, computation to support design process. So understand what design we're doing, what should we do? Okay, so I work on a project called electronic cocktail napkin. So the idea is that, like a napkin, you can draw a diagram, and I can show you how to get to my house or where to get something. We understand the diagram. So why couldn't computer understand the diagram? So this is like early 90s. Uh, we do simple recognition, so you do a three by three grid, you can look at a sequence with a rotation or different orientation, you can recognize different shape. And then for different shape, you can build them up. So maybe two different lines become cross, cross another circle, become female, or triangle on top of the house. So you can build a whole language like from symbol and continue doing that. And what I wanted to know is what's in the diagram that a computer should understand. So if we can understand each other's diagram and architect is drawing diagram, why shouldn't a computer understand that? And if you look at this, this is a collection of 60 people say, hey, draw me a sun, draw me a figure, draw me the architecture, like lights coming into the windows or lights coming from the second floor. So you can see the convention of symbol. You can recognize the element. Some of them are, oh, you know, that's a wall, that's probably a window, even though it's just one line. Okay, so another thing I did is I interview like an architect using SyncLab protocol. So as he was designing uh, the office for himself, and you can analyze the transcript about what he said, what he draw, and then what kind of thing he was doing. And this is very interesting because you see the reasoning and the thinking behind. And this one was dimensional reasoning. For example, he knows that he needs to fit uh, 800 square feet space for like open space and the uh, width is 25 feet so 25 okay 4 times 25 is 100 so and we need 32 4, 4 times 8 is 32 so 20, yeah so 800 become 4 times 8 and then he wrote down 800 so all the process so even though final drawing have numbers but the sequence of that was humans reasoning okay 
So that became very interesting because then I was curious about different elements. So this is one of designer drawing from like 300 of them, and he was playing with a different element, like a chimney or staircase or stripe windows. And so similar to the symbol recognition, we can look at each one of drawing. Where are they? So you can see the elements were changing and moving. So each one of the drawing could be a representation, right? Element 16, uh, staircase in the location number four with different translation, move to location number nine, and then this is another one which is a different perspective. So you can look at all the drawing sequence as they do. You coded them, you can see they're doing different exploration, whether it's breath first or depth first, so that's very interesting. So in that, I was curious to analyze design um, process. Okay. So my dissertation was called The Right To At The Right Time, and it actually started with, I was working with Janet Clowner on the Archie, the case-based reasoning. And so the system was supposed to be able to help architects to find information, but nobody's actually typing the text. And they said, as a designer, I draw. So if you can give me the right information when I'm drawing, that'll be useful. So the first thing I built was diagram indexing and retrieval of a case based library. So as I draw the different shape, maybe two room is a lobby, so I could find a similar floor plan to the layout. And this one is a visual analysis. So I build this because of view shape analysis. As I stand here, what I can see or where I can see could be different. So instead of ray tracing the 3D, just the 2D, two-dimensional view shape analysis was enough to show people where you can see, where you cannot see. Okay, and this one was um, a request from the architecture students because quite often they are looking for some slides. They know how it looked like. They don't know who the architect was, where was it built, or which year was it built. So if you go to a slide library, that's the only way you can find it. And ended up you talk to a librarian and say, hey, give me that building looks like that. So again, this is diagram indexing and retrieval. So I draw the triangle, the roof, and the columns, and the ground, and I can find the passing on. So, or maybe another building looks like that. And this one is also another request from the students because when we draw isometric view, we can use simple computer vision to recognize concave or com convex, and I can turn that into a 3D model. So instead of, after you're drawing, start doing CAD, you could translate from your freehand sketching to different things. So that's why I said right to at the right time. And it was a fun journey for me because then I realized a lot of things can do for sketching as an interface to different things. So shape-based reminding. So maybe I draw a different circle, then can I retrieve interesting flowers, pictures. So that's another passing on like animations. And there are many stories from the architect talking about, hey, they were inspired by hat or human figures or even Sydney Opera House could be turtle or something else, or seashell. Okay, so the idea about when people draw, when they design, is actually a way to find reference or be reminded by something else is interesting. And from there, sketching as an interface for everything. So for example, this is early days. So in order to build a website, in the past we are coding an HTML. So what if I say, hey, here's a title, this is a picture. Once my cocktail napkin recognizes the, the symbols, then it can replace the simple text that I wanted to put in. So you can have web, I mean, sketch to website, or sketch and speech together. So this project is called design analysis. So the idea is that maybe we are having a conversation as we draw where we should go. We're recording the speech at the same time. So we can use the speech later to find the information say, oh, last time we have a conversation. We talk about the arrangement of the kitchen should be next to it. So you can go back, you can search the keyword, or you can click on the drawing and then it will play back. So synchronization of the drawing and speech together. And some people say that would be useful for maybe meeting or conversation. So you cannot say, hey, you make that decision without me. But if we go back to look at that conversation and drawing, we actually know who <laughs> said what. Okay. And this is another one also because of the student's request. Many of them, when they draw the floor plan, they look at them and looks nice. Okay. But what designer are doing is actually they're drawing a 3D space. So if you can recognize the symbol, and you can recognize symbols here, like 
a couch or table or TV. So if you recognize them, you can draw them different places. You can extrude them and turn that into virtual reality. So this was VIML, so you know how old that was. So quickly, and then also people were interested in different shapes, so you can draw any curve and morph into any other shape. So that was a quick way to think about sketching as an interface to everything. And besides just sketching, it's supporting design. So once we have the older space, we, if we know which room is what, we can have rule-based system uh, with constraints and critiquing. So for example, this is a hospital layout, and it recognizes ICU here, and there's an inpatient room, and then it sees you, how do you pass from one room to the other room, it can tell you this one, which one should be next to each other, or which one should be closer. So you can have a critiquing of your design. And then from 2D to 3D, you receive the virtual reality. And we started showing different people, hey, this is the room, this is the space you're going to inhabit. And then a lot of people have comment. I don't like this too open. Can we draw another wall? Or the window is the wrong place. Can we move? So we use the virtual reality as a way to do annotation to indicate the design decision. And then we can also implement the different object uh, geometry and changing that. And so that was like a simple geometric addition. But we also put a little, I said, it would be real based system. It's not too much of AI. So designers said they want to paint with light. So if I paint the wall, that means I want flood light. So there's a big um, tunnel of light just come up. And if I paint over on the kitchen counter, maybe it should have a different light just directly above. Or if I paint the painting, maybe the, the light for the painting should not be direct, should be in an angle. So there's a little configuration and reasoning about where you want things to happen and where things should be placed. So <coughs> from sketching to design support and to knowledge-based system, we are supporting how designer in the design process. And this, a couple one is also interesting, the idea about sketching as everything. So people want to build their doll houses and using uh, laser cutter. So again, simple computer vision. If I recognize which way this is facing, I can turn that into flat path. And depends on the material and the notches, so we can automatically generate the notches. And so you can send it out to laser printer, you can cut it, assemble it. And so another student is doing something similar because he wanted to design his own dinosaur. So they could be two-headed or one tail. Um, so you can sketch, you can have constraint. And so right now, this has turned into a startup company to let people draw constraint and then send it out for uh, rapid prototyping. Okay, so this is the first part about design sketches. So what I have done as a graduate student and the first few years when I was at the University of Washington was supporting designer in their different exploration, specifically for architect or for different object design. And then I want to talk about smart object, because in the process of supporting sketches, we also realized that the idea about sketch as an interface to everything, what if we extend it to your built environment is the interface to everything. So if we talk about smart object, we're talking about smart living environment. I think the term people are using right now is like Internet of Things, okay? What would it mean if everything is connected? What kind of interaction do we want? So what I mean is about physical and computational enhanced environment, how you facilitate people communicate with each other or interact with each other. And as I said, is the idea about build environment as an interface to everything. Okay, so how do I look at this? So I come with the human-centered view of the smart object, maybe the different scale, right? There could be the hand scale, something you can grab, there could be a body scale, and it could be furniture, or it could be a larger environment as you move around. And what I map that into is intelligent object, responsive furniture, and also interactive environment. And there are many applications, for example, health, awareness, or entertainment. So I'm going to show you a little bit some of the different projects. So first about intelligent object, which means everyday object could be an interface. Something you grab, you can use that to communicate or do something else. Okay? Or the responsive furniture. Yeah. 
So instead of hardware, software, we could have chairware, tableware, and everywhere. Uh, so things could become an interface, and or a larger environment, computational enhanced environment. So everything is all about sensing and actuating. So we know where you are, we know what's going on, and then we make something happen. Okay. So for example, the first one, this is my student um, Ken, and he was. This was at University of Washington. So we're doing a tourist kiosk for the Pioneer Square. And the idea here is we build a physical block called navigation block. So who, why, when, where. So as you rotate, we can sense which direction you are. So who could be the founding father, or the miner, and what could be the the fire or the the gold rush and when could be 1890 or 1910, and then where it could be in the Pinot Square or Chinatown or whatever. So as you rotate, you're doing the end query, and so different information will bring up. So that that was one of the first um, physical computing project we have done. So this one. Oh. So this one is a construction toy. Okay. So the idea is the hub instruct toy. So we have different light pattern inside each on the hub. So as we put together, you're composing, for example, like the head and the legs for that. So you can skin it, turn that into a dinosaur. Or you can use that for a chemical model, molecule. So you can put hydrogen, hydrogen, and then oxygen. So that turn into a water. So physical construction kit could also be exploration of doing different things. Okay. I want to make sure there's sound. Okay, so the next project, oops, next project is called the Piano Touch. And so Kevin in my computing creativity and design cognition class want to learn to play piano. And he said, I have no time to practice, but one of the hardest things is remember the fingering. So when I hear the sound, when I see the note, I need to know which one to do instead of doing crazy things. And so the whole class laughs. And why don't you build a possessed hand? Okay, that's what I built. So what you have is the vibration motor on top of the finger. So when you hear the sound, it's tapping you. Okay, and I'm gonna show you a video, but I wanna make sure that it's sound. May not make you dance like Michael Jackson, but it could teach you how to play music. This is the mobile music touch glove. Oh. And what it's going to do is teach you how to play a piano melody without you paying attention. Students and professors at Georgia Tech, the glove uses it's vibration to teach your fingers it. the notes of a song. Right. So, so you're going to teach me how to play those notes. So, yep. I've got zero experience. Right? Sure. So Never I played before. before. We will have you wait 30 minutes or so. You can be reading your email or jogging anyway, so or talking with me. And, and the system will tap your fingers and over and over again in the sequence of notes that you can play the song. Gloves again. And that was a really good interview. After 30 minutes of conversation, he tried it out. Most of the notes was correct, and only a couple was wrong. Uh, so <laughs> Everything except the end. People, yeah. for people Along with teaching people how to play before, music, we the glove can also be used to help people. This could be used song. to help people like with partial spinal cord injuries, uh, recover some of the sensation and, and some then, dexterity and then in their hands, you know, up to a year post-injury. Like they Rick Lynch, the a quadriplegic who participated in an eight-week Shepard Center study, wearing the glove about two hours a day, Three or four him improve mistakes. his typing skills without feedback they have 10 or 20 mistakes so that was using one finger to and type and then we connect with the now I'm spinal cord rehabilitation two fingers on one hand. center this and so the idea there is that instead of doing rehab that's very boring we say hey who wants to learn to play piano learn how to so play we the follow piano. seven patients for three months Joe and Carter, they wear the glove listen Atlanta. to music every day each one of them have increased their sensation in the movement so the other one is that early day you saw me doing electronic cocktail napkin to support designer. So a neuroscientist in New York contacted me because his job was to do um, dementia and cognitive impairment assessment. What he do all day is let people draw and measure how deviate they were from the drawing. So a clock depends on the dementia or Alzheimer's disease progression. Some of the number is not in the right place. So even you ask them to copy a, a building, many of the parts not there. Okay, 
So this is the project I have built with my student, the clock drawing test, automatic clock drawing test. And so the idea here we is usually tell people, PC, okay, here is the clock. Numbers, Draw all the number of the clock the and set down the time. Where the numbers Let's are, set the time, are they 10 the past 11. Once we, the, uh, the patient finished that, and all that, the technician so will look at the drawing the and then they look at the different criteria. Then so in our system, we use the 13 points criteria. So what we have so here is that each one of the 13 points indicated whether are there all the numbers scoring, in the clock, but we are all the numbers in the right position? One is Do you have the have long hand and the short drawing. hand? So for example, Do you have the, the center? Last are they pointing right in the now, right five, six, time seven. and but today minute? I asked if we can make this available so to people one. like in the shopping mall or community center or even in every clinic, we may be able to screen and detect more people who never get diagnosis until very late in their stage. Also, so, because we are um, reporting that we have the air we think it will so be possible one, two, to three, detect four, early symptom of Alzheimer's disease okay, with this five. tool, and we're so, excited about that. The final drawing is the same. So, doctor was very excited about this because now we have revealed more information, and we also recorded as animation, so we can print it back. You can bring it back to the patient's family, and say, "Hey, the final drawing looks fine, but you can see last week and this week the strategy has changed." Also, the pressure was interesting as well. When people are depressed, they tend to be writing lightly, and when they are like excited about it, they write it hard, stronger. Okay, fine. All right. So this is another one. This is the um, digital box and box test. So another therapist talked to us that right now it's very expensive. You have to send somebody to their home, bring the little box, and to for the stroke rehab, you measuring the progression of rehab about how many blocks do they pick up and put to another place. Okay. So what we have done is we put a simple connect so we can recognize where the hands are. This one doesn't have sound, that's okay. Uh, and then we start recognizing the depth. So we know which block you're picking and how many of them. We also know did you move the whole hand or did you use another hand to help or did you just only move the, the fingers, not the full arm. So the therapy was very interested in being able to see more information. Okay, so that's the second part about my talk. And I'm going to do the last part. So last part, I spent three and a half years at National University of Singapore. So I was on leave from Georgia Tech without pay um, because I've never taken a sabbatical anywhere. So first I went there as a semester. And then when I showed up, I realized that it's an interesting lab. So I organizing, um, curated different projects. And the idea is that it was called a Q Center originally stand for Connected Ubiquitous Technology for Embodiment which is great. We talk about connecting people, ubiquitous computing, but nobody remembered the acronym, and I decided to change it to be creating unique technology for everyone, and you can see why, because all the project is kind of playful, and we want to make sure things are unique. So if you come to Q Center, you will see a lot of projects, but I organize in three different areas. One is tangible interaction. So you can see my trend from sketching as the interface to everything to everything object as the interface to everything. So tangible interaction is still very important. But we are also interested in augmented learning. So augmented reality or virtual reality and how that play a role in learning. And another one is the embodied experience because we all live in this world. What kind of thing do we experience and can we recreate that or remind people what you have experienced when you are in different places? Okay, so if you come, you see lots of people uh, from different disciplines, about 10 different disciplines coming in, in my lab, the Q Center. So first of all, embodied experience and we work with different industries. So this one was with the the Denso, the Japanese car maker, and they were interested in vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication, and this is a helmet inside for the motorbike, because quite often there are lots of accidents. So if you are in the blind spot of other car, you will turn red. So as you're moving around, it's telling you, don't do stupid move right now, not, none of the other car can see you, but if you move, then maybe that turns into green. So that was doing vehicle communication. And this one is called a cloud trail. And so the idea is that, combining maybe Google Map and Yelp and all kind of things. So you can curate your own trail, like this is my secret trail, this is the coffee shop I go to, or this is the, in Singapore you have chicken rice or other things. And we work with the National Heritage Board. Okay. So National Heritage Board, so the idea is that they have many brochures. The walk in Chinatown, uh, the little India, the different places, but nobody ever take the brochure. So we turn that into 
the app. So right on the spot, you can see what are the secret trail you could. Then you can also annotate and narrate that for different places, for food, for experience. Okay, and then another thing is you can see people talking about food, and what we build is like 3D cookie printer. So instead of inject printer. We figure out how to make different dough. Turn off printing the dough wasn't as easy because you have water and the different things put in together. So the idea is that you can have different tubes and you can print them out and then you can bake them. So turn off it was very popular with the kids because when they see this something that they can design and print it out, um, they are willing to eat it. So one of my friends said her daughter only wants to eat everything is pink, so she has to use beet juice try to dye broccoli into pink or whatever. Uh, so the idea is that if they can design their own shape, share it, exchange it, or print it out, maybe you can encourage more consumption of healthy foods. All right, I'm gonna go next. I'd like to have some, but. Okay, so this is a student project. Those are undergraduate students and they student design competition. So the idea is that they were talking about their wants for the elderly that live by themselves. Maybe they have to be more contact with their family member. They don't want to call them. But they kind of want to know what you're doing. Uh, and so the idea is... <laughs> so instead of calling... So the idea here is that they have created, since people will look at the picture, they kind of tracing them. So they decided to do um, the screen with a two-way communication. So if most of the time you know that you see what your loved ones are doing, okay. Okay. Uh, wiping off the fog on the screen. If I start doing like screen. fingerprinting and moving that, it will send sound on the other side. It also and so alerts people you there, of the they moment to, that they are thinking uh, of communicating through they audio and visual to feedback. Their screen and also wiping at the same time. So you synchronize it by wiping to wipe and wiping at the same time. Then the both clear. Time, okay. They are able so the to enjoy a spontaneous conversation. Each other if you happen to be at the same time. But of hey, course, we're talking about privacy. What about you don't the moments that you want to keep private? Is that so the difference between worry. your layer and Inside other people's layer is separated feature. controller. Unless so you wipe maybe off your somebody was down there, so you don't want to go to the community clearly. center. You just wipe it off. Say, hey, your Johnny there is a shrink today. And Johnny there say, I'm saying come. Then maybe you go. After right, so the idea of this is a cute little project. Inside so the idea about technology is supporting communication. Okay. So the augmented learning. Uh, we did a lot of projects with the museum because everybody's into like augmented learning. So for example, in the design um, exhibit, you could have a, a regular painting, but with our augmented learning, maybe today I'm very happy. So the person is smiling and the butterfly is flying, or maybe today I'm in lousy mood. So the same picture could be rendered as a skeleton or unhappy, and this one could be have different animation of the tractor moving, or rainbow and changing the weather. So in a way, you can use augmented reality to display information further than the painting, right? There could be <laughs> the timer, uh, you can see the change of time, and once you have that, you can also be interactive as well. So for example, the painting of the cocoon and butterfly, and if the person tap it, you can stop, you can observe more, you can tap it, a continuous animation, or you can play it back. So we did experiment testing people what they remember about painting. Um, many paintings only have title or explanation, people don't read them, but with the uh, augmented reality, people remember what the painting they have experienced. So we did a whole bunch of projects with the Science Center about like dandelion, you have the butterfly on top, so then or wind blowing, the dandelion is flying, so you can have a little interaction, you mute your screen, and we can use the same painting for multiple exhibits because every time we, when you trigger, um, we know you have been here before, and we can even download the new app for you to interact. So could be a butterfly, could be a shampoo, and could be any product online. <laughs> I mean, on the shelf. And this one was for the science center for the colony, colony collapse for the people who were infected by the mice. And so the kids will need to figure out how do you get rid of the mice.
was Procter and Gamble beginning a couple projects they want us to come to open the reality to help people understand what the product on the shelf is useful. So let me go, go on. Um, this one won the design competition at Kai, and it was actually an old girls team, so I was very proud of that. Um, the kids come out with the idea with just a connect, and people want to learn to spell language alphabet. Okay, so you can select through cycles through the different word you want to spell, and then with your body, you are. Generating the shape. Okay, so she has chosen to fill flat. All right. So if you fill the profile green, you got the point. And if you rock it, then red. And there's also time, so you can time see how fast they do. And the kids were doing that. Like I'm doing now with L, and we take a snapshot anytime you got it recognized. Okay, so people are rewarded. They know that. Okay. Getting the point. Time. We got A, L, A. We got what? U. Okay. So, see if you have a U. Yes. Okay. Got it? Good. Okay. L, A, U. What's next? G. G, G, G. So, she's looking for a friend to help because G was too complicated. <laughs> so, she just got stuck with a little to the G. Okay. L, A, U, G. She knows. Because this is a common help, so we got it. Now we all together. And we put this in the National Museum because every summer they have a children's season, and we put it for three months, and just it didn't break. I'm very, very happy with that. Um, so at the museum, you will see the kids having fun. They come in with their friends. Some of them lie in the queue, come back again, and they see the previous person got it in three seconds. They want to do it in two seconds, or they will come back again again. But last time I do it this way, maybe this time I do another thing. Because we have picture, we can see the same kids come back, and then maybe to each other. So this was an interesting experiment, also collecting data. Okay, um, yeah, and you can see with parents or with their friends, our classmates. Okay, so we also did a couple projects um, with the School of Medicine. So the idea is that for the first day, first year education, they have to do the dissection. But dissection is complicated, um, take time, also smells bad. Um, what if we can do a virtual anatomy that you could come at different time, everybody can play a game and take apart a different organ and put it back, but you have to put it back the same way that it's supposed to be and to learn about it. And so this right now, we are working with a different uh, professor to figure out the different courses, a curriculum, how we can do that. So that part is about anatomy, so you can select different layer, take things apart, or um, this one is for the virtual simulation. So we can do a little tutorial. Um, imagine you are in the hospital. So you don't have sound, but you will hear the sound and you actually record it in the So you hear all the noise and everything. Um, you can have like different procedure, like incubation. So one. number one, you should take this, take this equipment, put it in, in the right place for how long. Right, and then so we can score you if you have done it, how long does it take? And so you remember, okay, remember grading, doing all kind of things. Um, yeah, so the next one is like this, two, and then you have the things that you're supposed to. Right, so individual one, and I think we built a couple different things, including the pumping the air and defibrillation. So, like, one, two, three, how many seconds do that? Okay. So those are about virtual reality and augmented learning. And the last one is the tangible interaction. So we come a full circle uh, as the idea about everywhere, everything, okay? So this project, um, we got the like the best paper prize for doing the tangible token. And we work with the people from Borneo because they are the nomadic tribe. Um, in the past, they put object language in the forest. Like, for example, 
I shot a wild boar, so I put a leaf on top of branches and then tied the knot. And that's just signifies to the rest of the village where to go. And the elders would worry about the young generation don't know any Baba language. So they come to us, so we build a little stamp thing. So you can pick the different leaf and register on the iPad. And so the kids were teaching each other. So before with the, the intervention, the kids didn't know any of the object. But once they start doing the thing, the parents were helping them. So they learn a lot more about the object language, what does that mean? So next time they go to the forest, at least they will recognize other villagers have left information for them. Okay. So this one's interesting. So I was mentioning, we're talking about experience design, and quite often we talk about um, audio and video. But this one is the digital tape. And this is um, testing on the canteen, and people drinking the water actually can taste it either sour or bitter, but they were just drinking the plain water. So the idea here is that we are stimulating your tongue, tricking your brain to think about the different taste you have. And as you can see, we keep on tasting them. Delicious vessel, taste plus, it's okay. But we apply a little pulsation on the electro. So when you touch your tongue, it's doing tiny vibration. And depends on the frequency and pulsation, your brain actually perceives a different taste. Okay? Um, so we try to do it on the straw. We're trying to put it on a water bottle. And we also use color to help you think about, oh, blue ocean salty and or lime green sour or red wine bitter and coca-cola didn't like we use red for bitter because <laughs> coca-cola should be red should be sweet okay um and then we do i actually wanted this one i want to eat ice cream without a calorie so i told the student can you build me this spoon that when i lick this i can actually taste it and so we entered the stanford design competition for longevity challenge we won the second prize and this one is like a four point pen so you click switch it to sour switch it to bitter switch it to saltiness and we tested on some of the people who have diminishing uh, taste and they can sense the, the tip of the the spoon actually give them the different sensation. And one of the hospital geriatric will actually want to order 200 of them because they say many of them have so restricted diet. So all the porridge, everything is like boring, have no taste. What if we can give them intense taste? Okay, so the most recent one is called the virtual cocktail. And in our daily life, <laughs> so, why yeah, is it so hard to have an obvious. ideal drink? So, besides the they're color, either too sweet or the, not as sour as we want. Adding the smell, Here, we provide yeah. you with a solution the, to create your own drink with our virtual cocktail. Well. Virtual so cocktail is, is an innovative so drinking cocktail. We can now use the app to simulate three the digital tastes, generate uh, three scents, and light. So the By combining these the sensations, so the virtual cocktail can enhance the flavor of an existing drink, or overlay but flavors on plain yeah, water. It can so be this, controlled from your um, mobile through Bluetooth. My team will just flavor sensations can be customized depending on your preference. Whiskey company, they are doing like a event, and they want to people try to see. The visual simulation so gives users a certain the expectation of flavor. The electric taste is enabled a by a control current which simulates sour, bitter, and salty taste. The aroma is released when users so drink to give them a full flavor experience. <laughs> Without the need for excessive additives, everyone can enjoy any drink that they want. You can also share drink information to each other, recreating drinks digitally. Um, so you talk about, we talk about taste and smell, and this is another one about smell. So the idea is that if you have the pebble and you're not touching it, so it just it may, may be very calm, green tea smell. Once you touch it, you have the sensor, so you do vibration, so you can trigger the different smell. Depends on how hard you shake it, you can have different smell um, to enhance your environment. And this is presented at Kai this year. So the idea is, what if I want to go to another place and I want to experience it, right? So in the augmented reality or virtual reality, quite often we have video and audio. And what if we have also give you the wind blowing? So you can see those are the fans. Depends on where you go, the fan is in front of you. Uh, we have the smell underneath it. And we also have the thermal simulation in the back. And we test some people, then we find out behind your neck is where you are most sensitive. I think that's why you put scarf, right? So we can make it hot or cold so you can travel to another place, uh, to desert, or you can be in the sailboat or skiing, so the wind is blowing, you make it cold and maybe give you the smell of cinnamon or mint or coffee and so 
yeah, we we measure people's reaction and see how excited about it. Anyway, so that's just like full investment of the thing. Okay, this one I really want music for this because this is super cute. So when you turn it, it becomes solid. That becomes a sword. So you get a sound effect as you do it. Shoot, 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 shoot. You change. Okay. The other one is a 3D printed um, communication pattern. So this one is changing the sound. So first, it sounds like and once he changed the shape, it recognized that as. About it. Your object, different configuration, different sound, right? And then he can change the different thing. To flat is recorder, a curve is a saxophone, and then he can turn into other shape as well. So this is like a drum bit, okay? And or if he two together, that the sound. So it could be a bell or could be another ring. So that's one of the first things that this toy was built. So to support creative um, exploration. And then I bring it to the hospital and with the musical therapy. So now we can have each person have their one thing, one main band. So you could be organizing people changing to different instruments and we can also measure how hard you putting in, how long you're doing it as well. But then of course the student actually like this one better. Um, they want to have so use the store and we build this game called the real brain. So first you when you press go, you can fish the giant squid pirate. Uh, we won the Tokyo Game Show uh, the wonder of the award. So basically when they catch you then you turn that the fish into to a fight. And then if the squid is changing the weapon, like the cannon, then you need to go back to the flexible thing to deploy. Okay. So this is just another example about how physical interaction, how the sensing and actuating can also do other things. And I'm going to stop here. So I have time for people to ask questions and we work with different company and that's it. Oops. Okay. Thank you, Alan. So we have time for questions. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So you talked about working with students. Yes. What, what students? Is that generally like postgrad students or undergrad or what level? How many? Do you know how do you manage that whole? Uh, all of the above. So for example, I talk about the inside. So those are actually undergraduate students. I think they were like years second. So we have in National University of Singapore, we have vertical studio. So first year, second year, third, fourth year could be all enrolled in the same studio, a project base. So I actually don't know which one is second year, which one is first year, right? But then um, usually I get them through different exercise, different workshop and say, okay, now think about the project. So for example, that year was about um, digital wellness for the, the elder. And so people come up with different ideas. And the other year was like digital play. And so they were doing the things like the, the alphabet for the kids. So those are undergraduate. But then um, look at different things. So for example, like the, the sword, that's already a PhD student, but he was having fun. Uh, <laughs> Which is okay. And then, so I think what I've done in the lab is that I make that into a giant playground. But of course, I can I didn't show you, but each one of them is a publication. So I encourage them, if you do something, you know what that is working for, and you do user testing, you can publish, then I will help you send to the conference. And the, the students, or all of us, actually like travel. So that was a good incentive. Yeah. Other questions? And then, okay, at, at Journal Tech, the, we have the Master of HCI, Human Computer Interaction. Actually, I've demitted through four different tracks from industrial design, from computer science, from digital media, and from psychology. So they all have core courses together and they have elected. So I also enjoy having students come from different disciplines. Sorry, there were like a couple hands. Yes. Yeah. 
like to hear uh, how the designs of tangible interfaces are actually generated, how the ideas are generated based on any analogy or, yeah. So each project actually have a different origin. So for example, like the piano touch, and it was in my computing creativity and design cognition class. And that was actually a graduate seminar. So the first few weeks, we have different reading about computational support tool for creativity or creative um, design or different things and or the model of design. So as we read through that, we have discussion, we have activity. And then I said, okay, everybody come out with an idea. So we share with each other what you want to do. And then in the process, people may form team or do their solo thing. So that piano thing was coming up, I think after we watched like Picasso's drawing and I said, how much can we analyze the thing? And Kevin said, I want to play piano, I don't want to draw. Um, <laughs> so that was that, that was happened because of that. But then, for example, navigation block, and that was a different project because we are doing the Pioneer Square like tourist spot design. So everybody have to do something for that tourist space. And first he was building multi media cube in the virtual reality and each shape is mapped to a different movie other thing. Uh, as we we're talking about, he was using his mouse and clicking and moving around. I said, this is ridiculous, take it out. Let's take it out. So I want to find things, but having me have to click the shape to the back is ridiculous. And so that was the first reason he started building a physical block. So each project come with a different reason. And the cut drawing I didn't start the project. I was doing sketch recognition in my early days. So they say, we have this need. If you can understand the clock drawing, then we can use that for detect uh, to automate scoring. So each project come with a different reason. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, very interesting talk, very, very interesting. So I, I think one thing that we don't have here, or it's very difficult for, for pure like academic guys is we have ideas, right? We have something we want to make in the physical sense, but normally play the gap. Not so we want to have something to demonstrate, but then it's very difficult to uh, implement it for that. And so, so how do you do it? Do you have like a lab that have like experience the guys to do the physical things, or you you really just have ideas and then you send it to some companies that can make it? Oh, oh, sorry, all of this is handmade. So those are prototype. So we didn't send it to another person. So one of the things I. Um, advocate is think about Leonardo da Vinci, right? Because Leonardo is both a painter, architect, a mathematician, and all kind of thing. So when people know this is their project, they would try to figure out something. So if they tell me, say, this is my idea, and how do I do that? I say, oh, why don't you try this? Why don't you try that? So, and then especially when we have multidisciplinary person together, I mean, people coming from different disciplines, some people say, hey, I, I know how to use a workshop, like come, come with me. Or this person say, I have no problem programming, but I know never try anything with hardware. And so the electrical engineer say, oh, this is easy. I can tell you what that is. So many of them are doing just in time learning. And so a lot of them are prototype. But then, for example, like the clock drawing, we actually spent three years building it. So it's a software that's solid. Recently, a military hospital in China asked me, say, can I have the software? I said, well, that was five years ago. I'm not going to maintain it because all the students graduated, work somewhere else. So I ship it to him, but he managed to use that to collect the data and write analysis. So depends on how far the project is going, the level of the sophistication of prototyping or either the usable software. I think there's still lots of duct tape inside. Anyway, or not is it's a different thing. So if just demonstrating an idea, I think the idea is to find out who can help you, their makerspace, or learn enough, say, hey, can I do this? So for example, like the undergraduate project, those are industrial designers. And they never learned computing or programming. And because there was another person, they said, oh, computing is not hard. And so they started learning to program as well. Yeah. David. Um, yes. Yeah, very interesting. Lots of uh, interesting projects. The one that um, I was interested about was the CPR, because it's very important to get resistance. How were you modeling the resistance in that? Okay, that's a good question. So for that one, we did not do resistance, but we have a separate project, we're doing physical simulation. So the traditional physical simulation, you have the mannequin, those are very expensive. But in Singapore, we're actually trying to do different silicon or other things, so you can have the, the same feel. Mm -hmm. And so you can have virtual reality, you can touch something, and you can have the resistance. But 
that was just directly shooting from the screen. Yeah. So two more, one here and then Razor. So um, I'm really interested in, in the simulation taste mm -hmm. because I used to suffer from overweight because of I love uh, sugary drink. So I, I so I was thinking so if you, if that is manufactured or, or produced that can really use to prevent <coughs> or other disease because of sugar overdose. So uh, so my question is uh, how do you actually uh, accomplish that? Is that some uh, electrical signals through the tongue or is it yes. any chemical stuff? In no the chemical. The taste without chemical. So the dissertation of Nimesha Rena Singer is totally online. So if you want to ask me, you can find the sequence of pulsation. So saltiness, sourness, and bitterness is easy to simulate on your tongue because they are the iron channel. Sweet was harder. Kind of like life, right? The sweet is always harder, bitter and sour is easier. Okay, so sweet is the protein channel. So your taste buds need to be stimulated to open. So if we turn the temperature on higher and then lower it, and then some people, about 50% would taste the sweetness. And I made a decision not to put the sweet in the the bottle or the glass because with that we need um, the heat sink. It's much larger and bulky, so I just want to take it small. Um, but we did a separate thing for like a lollipop, so the idea is that you can hide things under the table. So a lollipop put in your mouth and then you can adjust the different taste. So yes, we like to commercialize it, but we cannot do it consistently 100%, and that's why I say Coca-Cola is interested, Pepsi is interested, um, but we are going to do something different. So we have done bowl for soup, like miso soup, <laughs> instead of lots of salt, maybe on the bowl, chopstick, so you go to dim sum and start doing all the soy sauce, and you're not supposed to touch the chopstick, but when you touch the chopstick, then you can actually taste the salt. Yeah, sorry, one more question there. So, uh, very interesting talk. Um, I was interested to know your experience about the evaluation phase of those different projects. Because if, uh, many of them are uh, presumably unconventional projects, and they need unconventional evaluation, especially the ones who lead to publication. So, like for example, alphabet learning, like, does it really lead to better reading capability of children or not? So any comments you can Right, we didn't evaluate whether they have a better reading or not. So we use that, that was in the museum exhibit for three months, so we collect like 3,000 data set. And what we can analyze from that is that the same kids come back with different strategy or other things, so we, we report that part. So if we work with school and say, can we measure that, that would be an interesting question, but we didn't do that. Great. I think we should end there, but um, you know, Ellen's around for a little while. So if you've got other questions, you know, don't hesitate to just grab her. But let's thank Ellen again for a very interesting talk. Thank you.